When I was 12 years old, nothing mattered more to my family than my bar mitzvah. It would be one of the only times that most of my relatives, uncles, aunts, cousins, and grandparents on both sides ever gathered outside of Mexico City. A close second was my bris, you know, the snip snip. <laughs> you see, I'm a Mexican Jew, one of a few thousand. My parents moved from Mexico City to the United States in 1980 after getting married and never moved back. Among my first and second cousins, my brother and I are the only gringos. Everyone else is a chilango, born in Mexico City. Spanish is what we spoke at home. My mom always had telenovelas playing on the TV in the background as I did my Hebrew homework on the kitchen table. But we didn't speak typical Spanish. We spoke some Spanish with some Yiddish, Hebrew, and eventually English sprinkled throughout. For example, when I was a toddler, I had a tendency to grab my butt, and my mom would yell, yell in her own hybrid language, deja de tocar tus tujas. Every Friday night, we'd do the three traditional Jewish prayers for the Sabbath, one for the candles, one for the wine, and one for the braided bread known as challah. And then we'd rip into some pollo con mole with arroz y frijoles while still wearing our yarmulkes. <laughs> On the ensuing Saturday mornings, my dad would make us French toast with the leftover challah before we went to synagogue. And when we returned from praying, we would fire up the comal and make quesadillas to dip in homemade salsa. In the months leading up to my bar mitzvah, we started going to the synagogue near our home in San Diego regularly so that I could get used to the rituals and prayers. You see, my ability to properly recite the necessary, necessary Hebrew readings for the religious ceremony was critical to my success. I believed that my ability to read these scriptures flawlessly was the only way to gain approval from my family, friends, the girls in my class, and of course, God. But I grew up in a constant tug of war between my faith in religion and my curiosity for science. I grew up learning about the theory of evolution, the existence of dinosaur bones millions of years old, and that the universe began with a bang billions of years before that. All of these concepts are in direct conflict with Jewish religious texts. Yet I very much believed in a Jewish God, an omnipresent and ubiquitous God. The God I grew up with was not a cloud daddy, this God was everywhere and everything. And like this God, Jewish influence was pervasive in my life. I attended Jewish day schools, Jewish youth sports leagues, and Jewish summer camps. My best, my best friends were Jewish, other, often, often Mexican Jews. Often other Mexican Jews. Being a good Jew consumed my thoughts. Every night, I would sit in my bed, <laughs> lean my head on the wall as if it were a direct line to God and pray. I prayed to be forgiven for any transgression of the day, whatever I got wrong on homework or tests and maybe a fib. I prayed to ace my tests and for my crush to like me. I prayed for peace on earth, to score a goal in the upcoming soccer game, and to get an electric guitar. I prayed for the sun not to explode. And most of all, I prayed for my mom to let me wear a platinum iridescent shirt, bleach the tips of my hair, and lip sync Cisco's The Thong Song in my bar mitzvah party. <laughs> But on the flip side, I didn't know how to reconcile a growing record of historical and contemporary cruelty and horror, a list that contains slavery and sexual assault to the Holocaust and Hitler to apartheid and AIDS. Then there were the illogical and gruesome bits of the religious texts in the Torah, or what's commonly known as the Old Testament. All of these atrocities and inconsistencies made me question the existence of an all-powerful, merciful, and loving God. Why? Why would these things ever happen in that God's world? But nothing threw a wrench in my wheel of Jewish faith more than my relationship with my grandfather, Mordechai. Toto, as we called him, was the youngest of a dozen or so children. He was one of two members of his family to survive the Holocaust. Toto and one of his brothers arrived in Mexico City with essentially nothing. And the only reason he got out of Poland was by stealing his sister's ticket. He never saw or heard from his sister again and the majority of his family. We will never know exactly what happened to her. Presumably, she was left behind with her, with her fate in the hands of the invading Nazis. It's not something we've ever talked about. In fact, I don't even know her name. In Mexico City, Toto eventually met my grandmother, who also left Poland as a young girl. 
We called her Babi, which is short for the Eastern European term of endearment for grandmothers, babushka. Toto established a successful cobbler, cobbler shop in Mexico City to support the family that he and Babi would later have three sons, the youngest of whom would become my father. Throughout my childhood, we went to Mexico City yearly to visit my grandparents, as well as my uncles, aunts, and cousins. Every time we flew in, the first stop was to get tacos al pastor, which were not exactly kosher. <laughs> we typically stayed at Tos Totos and Babis, the climax of which was Shabbat lunch, a long Saturday afternoon ordeal where the entirety of my dad's family would cram into the living room and dining room at my grandparents' house to eat a typical Mexican Jewish meal, matzo ball soup and enchiladas verdes. It was at this table that perhaps the family dish most representative of my childhood was conceived. Gefilte fish veracruzana. <laughs> Boiled ground fish shaped into a filet or patty covered in spicy tomato salsa. <laughs> but even if we speak a whole if even if we spent a whole week at my grandparents' house, it felt like Toto was nowhere to be seen. He was a living ghost, quiet and reclusive. He spent most of his time buried in his office moving between two typewriters one with Latin script and the other Hebrew. It was as if he was holding on to life by writing a Spanish Yiddish dictionary. And when he did appear, he was somewhere on the spectrum between disinterest and disdain. He was stoic and silent. He looked like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, but completely devoid of any humor. I prayed for him, for him to be happy, to be absolved of his pain, but I had no indication of whether God was listening because there was never a change. Even on the day of my bar mitzvah, Toto was nowhere to be found. He never got on a plane that day, opting to stay at home in Mexico City. He did, however, have my grandma bring me his tefillin. This religious garb consists of small black boxes the size of dice that contain tiny scrolls with Hebrew prayers. These boxes attach to leather straps and are worn around the head and arm during morning and weekday prayer. While it made sense that Toto didn't show up because he seemed to always just be out of sight, I was unsure as to why he was giving me his tefillin. Was this a gesture of entrusting me with the continuing the family's Jewish heritage? Or was he just dumping it on me? Did he actually want this to be passed on? And why me? I wasn't the eldest of his grandsons and we hardly spoke, so why me? Eventually, Toto's absence in my bar mitzvah fell into the background and the long-awaited day went even better than I could have ever expected. During the ceremony in the synagogue, I was flawless, aside from the puberty-related voice changes. <laughs> and for the party, I got to wear my Cisco-inspired shimmering outfit and slow dance, <laughs> and slow dance with my crush, crush with arms outstretched like two life-size Lego figures, war rocking back and forth. The next morning, when I opened my eyes, it was as if I had put on brand new glasses. I excitedly jumped out of bed, cautiously put on the tefillin, and prayed in my room. It occurred to me as I finished the ritual that this might be the first of many thousands of mornings when I would wake up as a Jewish man and pray before doing anything else. But that didn't last long. That evening, a call came into my parents' house. My mom picked up the phone and after figuring out who, to, who the call was for, called for my father. He proceeded to speak on the phone for a few minutes in muted Spanish. After hanging up the phone, he turned around with a look of vulnerability and tears in his eyes, something I had never seen before and have rarely seen since. After all, a Jewish man, sadness was a sign of fragility, an emotion to be swept under the rug. That morning, Toto, Mordechai Toto Grinstein was found dead with a noose around his neck. I'm not certain why he decided to take his life. He left no note. Was it his crippling depression? Had he lost faith in God? Or had the survivor's guilt of stealing his sister's ticket to life, leaving her to die, become too much to bear? While I don't have the answers to that, while I, what I do know is that my faith began to wither. After that day, I never wanted to pray again. I refused to ever don the tefillin Toto had given me. 
I couldn't reconcile how a forgiving and loving creator could let these atrocities happen in my family, let alone, a, let alone across millions more. Toto's death sparked a fire that turned the script of my life as a good, God-fearing Jewish boy into ash. I began to detach, detach from the Jewish life my parents had prescribed for me. I am not the head of a Jewish family. I am not married to a Jewish woman, and I do not have Jewish kids. In fact, I did the opposite. I married a Catholic girl in a defined act to be the first person in my family's history to marry a non-Jew. I would also become the first to divorce a non-Jew. <laughs> and as I grew older, I went on a mission to annul God, gorging through philosophy and science to find a way to disprove the divine. Whenever I enter a synagogue today, I'm torn apart by cynicism, fear, and resentment. Family gatherings, especially when religiously inclined, put me on the edge of a nervous breakdown. I try to avoid them at all costs, especially the bar mitzvahs. When I do show up, I avoid contact with my relatives because I'm ashamed of my reputation as the godless gringo, a wayward son. And with our Mexican machismo and Jewish jadedness, my family has never discussed any of this. We've never discussed what happened with Toto, nor have we ever talked about how it impacted our lives. In fact, some days I don't even believe Toto's suicide ever happened and wonder if I made up the whole story. But I know that isn't true. More than 20 years later, the tefillin are still in a closet, are still there in a closet in my old room at my parents' house. They sit on a shelf gathering dust next to the Cisco-inspired shimmering silver shirt, both having only been worn by me just once. When I visit my parents' house, I always pass a four-sided rotating bookshelf holding hundreds of defunct CD albums and VHS tapes. And at the very top of it sits Toto's Hebrew typewriter. Every time I see this relic, I think of my family's Jewish lineage, which can be traced back to the 1700s. And every time, I can't help but think that maybe, just maybe, this branch of my family's genealogical tree has come to a halt in a twig that represents me. But there's a flicker of light inside that is guiding me to not shut out this intergenerational trauma. It, t it tells me to let go of my pain and anger. It tells me that what I feel is nothing compared to what Toto must have endured. He was a person to me, just like me. I just got a much better lottery ticket to life than he did. I wish I could speak to him now, and though I can't, I can keep his voice and that of my family alive by resurrecting his Spanish Yiddish dictionary. After all these years of pushing away, I now, I now crave my family's traditions. Every time I go to Mexico City, I make sure to have a meal at Klein's or Klein's, a Mexican Tessin long frequented by my family. Even my grandparents used to go there. And I always get their specialty, Huevos San Marcos, an open-faced bagel topped with kosher salami and two eggs that's smothered in salsa ranchera. <laughs> Part of me feels a calling to open up my own Mexican Jewish restaurant here in the US. And it is perhaps through matzo ball soup, enchiladas, and gefilte fish verde cruzana, I can carry on my family's Jewish-Mexican heritage in my own way.